presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. What do we really want to accomplish with health care reform? How do we contain costs and provide everyone coverage? What is the goal of what's coming out of Washington? Find out. Dialogue is next. Cartan Hansen. Thank you for joining us here on Idaho Public Television, on the World Wide Web, and on public radio stations. For more than 50 years, five presidents have tried to reform our nation's health care system. We are the only democracy, the only advanced democracy on earth, the only wealthy nation that allows such hardship for millions of its people. There are now more than 30 million American citizens who cannot get coverage. In just a two-year period, one in every three Americans goes without health care coverage at some point. And every day, 14,000 Americans lose their coverage. In other words, it can happen to anyone. The time for bickering is over. The time for games has passed. Now is the season for action. Now is when we must bring the best ideas of both parties together and show the American people that we can still do what we were sent here to do. Now is the time to deliver on health care. And months after that speech, we are trying to find out if Congress can truly deliver a health care reform bill. What should Americans expect of a health care system? Joining me for a discussion about the status of health care reform and what it means to you is Dr. Ted Epperly. Dr. Epperly is a family physician and he heads the Family Medicine Residency of Idaho but he's also the board chair for the American Academy of Family Physicians. He's on the front lines of the battle for health care reform. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Hi, Joan. I, appreciate, I know your schedule's extremely busy, so I appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. Well, let's find out what, from your line, from your position on the front lines, the Congress is currently working on a number of different bills. Are they actually going to get something out this yes. session? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm absolutely confident. We will see a health care reform bill passed by this Congress. Uh, they have kind of a deadline ticking, really, of 31 December. And as you know, things stand uh, in the House. They have a tri-committee bill. Mm -hmm. And in the Senate, they have two committees' worth of bills, from the Senate Finance Committee and the Senate Help Committee. Mm -hmm. So what work uh, remains to be done is the Senate those, committees... Those crunching of, yes, those, of all those bills. ...will merge one into a single bill. The House will finalize its tri-committee bill, and then a conference committee will bring both together and merge it into one. The timeline is roughly they're looking at about mid-December to have the final bill to President Obama for his signature. And I'm, I am sit here with you today being 99 percent confident we will get this done. It won't be everything we want, but it will be a great start. And then I think it'll take a decade or so of further work to really kind of get it fine-tuned. Well, what do you think will be in that final bill? Just some of the, there are a lot of differences, but there are some places where they have a common ground. Could, could you tell me about those first? Yes. The bills are all crafted around four major items. One is coverage, one is cost, one is delivery, and one is insurance reform. I think what we'll see out of both sides of Congress that will come together in the final bill will be expanded coverage. It looks like we'll probably get to about 94 to 95 percent of all the people in the country covered, which is much better than we have right now in the United States. The second thing that I think they all agree on is a uh, large amount of insurance reform. And so there's going to be quite a bit in there to tighten up some of the policies that have happened across this country that have been, frankly, discriminatory to patients in terms of either being denied care or having pre-existing conditions, having caps on insurance coverage. The other big part of this, Joan, is the delivery side of the system. If we give everybody expanded coverage, but we don't fix the delivery side of the system, in other words, more primary care physicians, more access to a patient-centered medical home, more places to go for wellness care, for prevention, for acute care, for chronic disease management, then we actually haven't improved health care. We've actually worsened the crisis of access. 
it's kind of like giving everybody in Boise free bus passes, but then you only have two buses to put them on. Them on. So we must have delivery side reform as well. And then the last item is cost reform. We must get to a more, um, uh, a better balanced system in terms of the total cost of the system. Right now in America, it costs $2.4 trillion per year for our healthcare system. That's the largest single economic sector of our entire American economy. One out of every six dollars in this country is spent on health care. So we must get that under control. Medicare is programmed to be insolvent in 2017. So we've got a little less than a decade to get this right or we face a financial meltdown in this country over health care alone. Now, because this program is taped, we aren't taking any phone calls, but I did receive a number of emails and questions from our Facebook site. One came in from a woman who has a friend who has lupus, lost her job, had to buy insurance on the market, is paying $1,000 a month for a policy with a high deductible, and she's terrified to go to the doctor yes. because she's afraid any other condition is going to jack up her insurance yes. rates. Will health reform, some of the packages that are pieces are of legislation now, handle her problem? Yes, it will. You know, what the nice thing about is there will be a definition of a basic minimum package of health care. And what's in that basic minimum ca uh, package is everybody will have a basic primary care package where there will be wellness and prevention access for both acute uh, same-day management as well as chronic disease management, in her case, for lupus. There are a lot of things that can be done and need to be done for lupus to keep it under control as opposed to letting it get out of control and then having her face either an emergency room situation or a hospitalization that could have been avoided on the front end by paying attention. But you can understand attention. why. She's terrified a to go to the doctor. Absolutely. Because her health insurance rates went up dramatically. Absolutely. And she's afraid they're going to continue to go up. And, and you see, that's just the irony of this, is that people are afraid to utilize health care because of cost and or escalating premiums when just the opposite should be happening. They should be utilizing it to keep costs down. And so we must change the culture in America to have people recognize that we've got to invest more on the front end of the healthcare system, wellness, prevention, keeping people out of extreme situations, as opposed to paying for everything on the back end when it's all out of control. And so those are major features of the health care insurance reform and health care reform is to more value the front end of health care, not the back end of health care. And those are big things that will be part of, of the package. The other key piece in, in the insurance reform is catastrophic coverage for everyone. It is a crime in this country that the single leading cause of bankruptcy in our nation is from personal health care expenses. So you or I today could have an accident, could have something happen that could potentially bankrupt us. That can't happen in this country if we truly care for our people. So one of the big things is not only the front end reforms to health care, i.e. keeping people healthy and well, but also the back end catastrophic coverage so that if something happens, you don't go bankrupt and your family loses everything that they would have had if that hadn't have happened. Is, health, is getting everybody health insurance going to be enough? I mean, we, we've talked about getting right. these insurance in place, but right. What are we going to work on over that next decade if indeed yes. we get that bill through yeah, that, that gives people health insurance? Absolutely. It's a great question. And absolutely that getting everybody health insurance will not be enough because if you don't have the right types of doctors seeing those patients at the right times and in the right places, that doesn't equate to health care. Health coverage does not equate to health care. So a big part of the insurance re uh, of the uh, health care reform bills is the delivery side fix. It's to get more primary care physicians, more family physicians, more general internists, more general pediatricians. Our system right now overproduces subspecialists and we need a balance. In, in, in most of the world it's about a 50-50 balance between subspecialists and primary care docs. In the United States Right now, it's 70% subspecialists, 30% generalists, and if you look at the last decade of medical school, it's 90% going into subspecialties, 10% going into primary care. So we have a tremendous workforce imbalance that we also have to get right. Isn't that because how we pay, yes. how insurance companies pay, yes. drives who goes into subspecialties and who goes into general? How do you change that? Yes, absolutely. Payment is the big issue there. Uh, what our system pays for is to do things to people not to prevent things 
from being done to people. Right. So what we must do is revalue what it is we're paying for, i.e. what it is that we want to develop as a health care system. If we want a health care system that focuses on wellness, prevention, disease management, chronic disease management and stabilization versus taking care of things on the back end when people have strokes, heart attacks, chronic renal disease, needing dialysis, amputations of extremities, that all could have been prevented by basic good health care on the front end, if we change what gets paid for so that more is valued on the front end of the system than the back end, we will see then more students being re-energized around becoming primary care physicians as opposed to back-end subspecialists where things are done, procedures are done, imaging is done, all the high-tech, all the high cost of medicine is done. It's, it's ironic that competitiveness tends to raise costs yes. in, health, in the healthcare system because yes. it costs so much to get a second CAT scan and you have to, then you have to keep it running for patients so then you get more patients in so it all spirals up the costs. It so does. how do you begin to contain costs yes. on healthcare? Yes. Uh, the first step of two that I would mention to you is what it is that we are valuing in the system differently that we need to pay more for. I would contend to you, Joan, that what we're really, what's really coming out of the debate is that wellness and prevention are becoming something we must focus more on as a nation. We're not a healthy nation. And in fact, even though we pay more than twice the next closest country, we rank 20th in the world for our health care outcomes, 37th for an effective and efficient system, and 54th for a fair, just, and equitable system. So we must pay more for wellness on the front end. I think that will be uh, one of the, the major, major things that we must invest in if we're going to see health care reform happen. There was a study out of Maine that showed you at a certain point if you had more doctors and more doctors, more procedures were done, that health care wasn't actually improved at a certain point, less is better. Part of that was due to the number of doctors who just want to be doing it. Part of it was due yeah. to the patient's expectations. We want, yes. if I go to the doctor, I want that antibiotic because I don't feel well and I want to feel better and I think that this is going to help. As a patient, what do we have to change Absolutely. when we think about what we want in healthcare? You're right on track. And that was the second thing that I was going to mention that must change. And that's both patient expectations as well as patient involvement. If you take a look at the total amount of death in the United States in terms of the, what people die from, 40% of all deaths in the United States are due to health behavior issues. In other words, obesity, lack of exercise, what people eat, smoking behavior, drinking behavior, lack of seat belt use, et cetera, 40%. So if patients become part of the solution and are incentivized then to stay healthy, then there is something that can help decrease costs. So for instance, if patients either have a reduced premium or get some sort of payback, if you will, from the insurance system for maintaining ideal body weight, for stopping smoking, for cutting back on smoking, for decreasing the amount of alcohol consumption, for eating better, uh, if those things can be jury-rigged into the system, and there's no reason they can't, it's just that we've never decided to pay for that, then you can see how living better, staying healthy, can actually affect in a very positive way the health of this country. So I would contend, let's take a lot of that money from the back end of the system, overvalued, let's put it and reinvest it on the front end. We don't have to increase cost at all. There's enough in the $2.4 trillion system to pay for all of this. And then we start taking care of people, them starting to be incentivized for their own health. Then you start to affect the whole health care culture of this country. Well, we know early childhood education helps produce kids who are healthy, and we yes. know that preventing child abuse saves people's lives and prevents health yes. problems. And how do we convince legislators and other uh, government officials and the public yes. that we need to invest in things up front? Yes. Because there's not necessarily, I can, you know, if I know if I put someone in prison, I've got someone in prison. Yes. I don't know that if I send someone to preschool, yes. that they're not going to end up in prison. Yes. I mean, but how do, you can, how do you make that? You've been doing a lot of lobbying yeah. on this. How do you make that change? Just yeah. start money yeah. on the front end when there's no yeah. guarantee yeah. of a dollar earned and dollar yeah. returned. That's a really good question. I'd say two things to you. Uh, in regards to that. First, if you take a look at the world's literature on this, it shows that investment on the front end, prevention, wellness, chronic disease management, pays dividends in the long run. The second thing is to ch change the way legislatures and our government works. They work on a year-by-year -year budget. 
And so it's very hard for them to look long-term at investments. They look at a short-term, year-by-year budget in terms of what do we do now for a year. These sorts of investments take a decade. These sorts of investments take 20 years. And so part of what needs to change is the way governments think, legislatures think, in terms of long-term investments up front for longer-term gains down the road. That's not immediately seen and is hard to calculate into budgetary amounts when they sit down and try to balance a budget. Another email question we had is another kind of big picture question. Should uh, This comes from Jennifer. would like to know about the relationship between agricultural policies and health. What does the medical community have to say about the role of reforming farm policy to curb overproduction of cheap calories and animal foods in order to stem the preventable health care problems? Re really great question. <clears throat> I think good nutrition is at the epicenter of health. That and exercise really form most of the behavioral changes that people need to do. Michael Pollan just wrote a recent book called The Omnivore's Dilemma, and in that he kind of synthesized things down to a basic equation. He said, uh, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. <laughs> and I would say to you, get health care, not too much, mostly primary care. <laughs> because in but you're that, a primary care doctor. <laughs> of course. It gets back to a point you were just making too, though, that too much care can be toxic care. Right. Too much care, too much health care, can actually hurt you in our system. So where the balance is, just like it is in eating, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. We must get health care, not too much, mostly primary care. Because the value there again refocuses towards health as opposed to sickness. It promotes basically staying away from needing too much done instead of waiting until you're sick or ill and then getting a lot done, some of which can hurt you. In this process they, they estimate that those uh, health care institutions that are opposed to the reform system have spent 236 million dollars alone on just this effort. Yes. And the other side has, has spent a large money too yes. in favor. Has this money <clears throat> changed the way this bill has been approached? How has that yes. intense focus of a lot of dollars yes. changed the, how this reform has come about? Now you've seen yes. the process from the inside, testified before Congress, yes. met in the White House. How has, that, yes. how has that changed the focus? You're right on track. Um, James Monroe, our fifth president, said that we don't have a government that's made up of, of legislature. We have a government that's made up of special interest groups. What I've seen happen through the course of my year as president of the American Academy of Family Physicians is everybody that has a dog in this fight of 2.4 trillion dollars per year has come out of the woodwork to try to keep the status quo just as it is. The way it's played out in America is through misinformation, disinformation, anger and fear. If you get people fearful, if you get them confused about what's trying to be done, then they will opt to continue the status quo as opposed to making reform change. It's kind of like the devil you know is safer than the devil you don't know. So how I've seen this play out through the special interest groups is that they have sub rosa campaigns to get a lot of people in America very confused, very angry, and very fearful about change. It's primarily been around two things, cost and government control. And when people start to get fearful that the government may be part of the problem instead of part of the solution, or that how are we going to con control cost in a rapidly escalating deficit, then it actually causes people to want to keep the system just as is. One thing that's been very clear from both President Obama and Congress is that the status quo is unacceptable. And as I would mentioned at the top of our interview, it's actually fiscally insolvent. We will go fiscally bankrupt on health care reform, on health care issues alone as our nation ages. Right now in America, we have 40 million people that are age 65 years and older. In the next 20 years, Joan, that number doubles to 80 million Americans. We know that the greatest cost impact of a human's life is in the last years of their life. 
So if we do not get a better handle on health care reform changes now, when the Medicare population doubles from 40 to 80 million dollars, we actually face a tsunami of health care cost. Where does Idaho's delegation sit on this issue? Yes. Uh, being that we have three Republicans and one blue dog Democrat, a fiscally moderate Democrat, uh, our three Republican, uh, two senators and one representative are against the major reform measures. They all agree that we want health care reform. They all agree that we must control cost. They will all agree that we must have expanded coverage. They all agree that we must have a better delivery system. Where the big focus is that they're against is primarily with a public plan option where there may be more uh, a perceived or real governmental control of trying to balance a health care system. That's where ideology and philosophies really start to cl clash. For our uh, Democratic uh, representative, uh, Representative Minnick, uh, he uh, is much more supportive of the President, uh, President Obama's position and most of Congress. His big concern, of course, is around cost. How can we make this work in a way that doesn't increase deficit? I have talked one way or another with both our senators and bo both our representatives. They're all good people, all intelligent people all seen it a little bit different, but I think for the good of all. But uh, our three Republican uh, representatives uh, see this primarily as it's not the right package for America in its current configuration. Uh, Representative Minnick sees it as I uh, like the package, but we must control the cost. So when we get through this and we start moving into the next 10 years, so say yes. a bill does actually get out in December yes. and the president signs it and we move on. Yes. Where do we go? What's the next step after that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think what we'll continue to focus on are all four of those aspects. We're not going to get it right initially. So even though we have expanded coverage, it'll probably only be 94, 95 percent of the entire population. So we'll need to... So, yes, what happens to that 5 percent? Yeah, yeah. So that 5 percent is going to have to be picked up. Either an expanded Medicaid coverage or some sort of individual or an uh, employer-based mandate. We may move to an individual mandate where everybody must have health care insurance, just like we do to have a uh, driver's license to drive. On the delivery side, we won't get all the delivery side accomplished this year. It takes seven years to make a family physician, right. four years of medical school, three years of residency. So even if tomorrow we give health care coverage to everybody, we still won't have the workforce. So it's going to take some uh, a while to expand this workforce to get the delivery side of this worked out. So how do we not let the perfect kill the better? Yes, absolutely. That, I mean, we've heard a lot about the debate. Something passes yes. and then everyone's going to complain. Yes. Because it's not perfect. Yes, I agree with you. How, how do you convince the public that they need to hang in there? Yeah or at least, or find ways to improve what's already there. Yeah. It took us a long time to get our health care system just like it is. In fact, it's the perfect model for a capitalistic health care system. It incentivizes what gets paid to get done. That's our health care system. So to make a change in that will be an iterative process that will take incremental approaches over a fair amount of time. I would actually say to really try to get this really good for America, it'll probably take on the order of 10 to 20 years to get this right. So how does America hang in? They see major steps in the right direction this year and continued steps in the right direction over the following years, primarily around expanded coverage, improved delivery and access, cost controls that start to show that you know we are making a difference and bending this cost curve, and insurance reform happens so that people do not find themselves being unable to get insured, unable to um, uh, be capped in terms of their insurance bills, uh, denied for pre-existing conditions. I had a, a young patient uh, recently with an anterior cruciate, cruciate ligament tear, 23-year-old woman. She got denied coverage because of her ACL tear and was told that she not only would she be denied for her left knee where she had the tear, but they wouldn't cover her right knee <laughs> as well. That's not right. It's just not right in our system. So where we go is that we get major starts on all of this and that we continue to push these things forward over time. And where do we want to end up? What should America's yes. healthcare system look like? Yes.
great question. I think what our system should look like is everyone is covered so that nobody stands the risk of financial bankruptcy or insolvency because of their health care problems. Number one, everybody gets covered. Number two, everyone has a personal physician that they know by name. And in that relationship of trust comes somebody that's looking out for your best interest to either help you with 95% of your problems or help direct you through the system so that you get the right type of care from the right person at the right time as opposed to this fragmented system we, we have right now where you're kind of pinging around in the system not exactly sure if anybody knows what's going on with you. To integrate and coordinate that care you must have a primary care physician. There must be usage of electronic medical records so people can start talking to each other from the emergency room to the office to the consultant to the hospital as opposed to these silos we have where we don't even talk at all to each other. <laughs> I can't get information from a practice across my street, but I can use my ATM card anywhere in the world and get money. What's wrong with that picture? <laughs> so we must do a whole lot better job in terms of that. So we must have expanded coverage. Health insurance must be equitable for people. We must have a delivery system that focuses on primary care, the patient-centered medical home, and the cost must be something that we get under control. The cost we can get under control by valuing what it is we want to pay for in the system as opposed to what we're now paying for in the system. So that means that there would be a lessening of the payment for a lot of procedures and a lot of imaging studies. Those need to come down in cost just like with new technology in the computer industry and any other industry we see a lowering of cost and then we need to shift some of that savings to the front end to get again to keep people from needing all those things to be done in the first place. We have about 30 seconds left. Okay. If people are confused about health care reform, where should they go to get information? Besides, of course, our website. We have website, we have links on our website, but where do you recommend people go? Yes. <clears throat> a couple great places. Um, AAFP.org. Right, which is you can find on our website. Yes, is a, is a great uh, nonpartisan distributor of health care information on this. There is a factcheck.org as well that you can go to bipartisan, uh, that you can check uh, any issues you have in terms of the uh, truth around these issues. Uh, uh, PolitiFact.org uh, also is another way in which, actually it's PolitiFact.com, in which you can check out uh, for uh, true information or misinformation so that you can see what's real and what's not. All right. Thank you, Dr. Epperly. I certainly appreciate you taking the time. I know you're heading back to Washington to continue, which is why, of course, we taped this because you're heading back to D.C. to continue working on this issue. I appreciate you coming. And again, if you have uh, any questions about this, you can go ahead and check out the Dialogue website. We've got links there and facts. And be sure to check us out on Facebook. Go ahead and look for Dialogue on Idaho Public Television and find us and become a friend. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Dialogue. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. To order a copy of this program from Idaho Public Television, call our toll-free number or visit us on the World Wide Web.